and so Pinocchio is left without the guidance of conscience and the cricket is trying to figure out how to get off Pleasure Island but he goes through the gates and he sees what's actually going on and what's going on is that the coachman has this like slave boat down in the bowels of the island and he's got all these these black suited minions with the glowing eyes working for him and they're rounding up what look like donkeys and so they're beasts of burden right and so there's an idea here that if you produce if you pursue impulsive pleasure to the detriment of the development of your character you're going to end up a beast of burden you're going to end up a slave to a tyrant and that's exactly right and so anyways the cricket doesn't you can see one of those black suited horrors here hauling donkeys out of this crate and one of them has a hat on and they look very sad and they're in different crates and one of them says sold to the salt mines and one says sold to the circus and so they're shipped off to be to be slaves roughly speaking and they look very sad and then one of them gets hauled out of a crate and he's still got a hat he has a hat on and a sweater and he can still talk he's a boy it turns out that's been half transformed into a jackass, a braying jackass, prior to being enslaved. And so that's, that's another thing that's quite interesting about the story. You know, it, it, it also makes the case that if you replace your voice with stupid braying, that the probability that you're going to become enslaved by a tyrant is extraordinarily high. And I always can't help but think about ideal, ideologues in that manner. You know, Solzhenitsyn wrote about the radical left ideologues that got thrown in the Gulag Archipelago, you know, so they were par party stalwarts, this happened to a lot of people, true believers who were vacuumed up by the Stalinist machine and thrown, in, thrown into the Gulag anyways. And he said that those people suffered in some ways more than ev everyone else because, what did he say, they were bit by the beloved hand that fed them. And so the first while when they were in the camps, Solzhenitsyn really didn't know what to do with people like that because on the one hand, well, they were in the camps and wasn't that awful and they've been torn away from their families and, you know, stripped of all their identity and their status and so that's pretty rough. But on the other hand, they were writing letters protesting their innocence and assuming that everyone else in the camp was guilty but they were innocent and they were still strident believers in the communist process. And so, you know, it was a conundrum. Here they are being terribly punished but by the same token they're also the perpetrators of their own demise so how do you deal with them? And they used to play comrades, he said they used to play comrades with people like that and invite them into an ideological discussion about the camp situation and the situation in the country as a whole and let them rattle out their ideological justifications for everything that had happened in, in trying to make them parody themselves, roughly speaking, it was a rough game and Solzhenitsyn also concluded that there was no helping someone like that when they were still ensconced inside that braying ideology you could predict everything they were going to say it's like someone had a crank you could just crank it and out would come the proper ideological formulas but then he realized that as soon as they let's call it repented of that and started to realize their their own role in it or the error of the system then he would start communicating with them, you know, as if they were people who who you could communicate with, yeah so that was very interesting as far as I'm concerned, anyways this kid is still a little bit human, he starts to cry for his mum and the coachman basically throws him back into the crate and says that he's not ready yet and the reason for that is that he could still, he still had the power of independent speech you remember, right at the beginning of the movie, when the mouth was painted on Pinocchio we saw that mask that was really glaring at the process and I said that character recurs continually throughout the movie and this is a good example of that because the coachman is the enemy of anything that has its own voice so he's the anti-Geppetto, that's a good way of thinking about it he's the tyrannical aspect of the, of the culture but as insofar as one of these mostly donkeys, mostly jackasses can still talk then they're not completely fit for slavery and you remember this movie was also being made at about the same time that um, the Nazi transformation of Germany was taking place and so all these terrible underground things, you know, this, this process whereby people were being reduced to, to ideological slaves, say, 
and in this terrible process that was all playing out in Europe in a very big way and it's not like people weren't aware of that you know it was in the air so anyways the the donkeys the jackasses that can still talk are crying and complaining and repenting and the coachman turns into a full tyrant again and cracks a whip if I remember correctly and says you've had your fun and now you're gonna pay for it so the cricket gets word of all this he gets wind of it he starts to understand what's happened is that all these bad kids were enticed out onto this island so that they could be enslaved and he's really um, taken aback by that to say the least but he realizes what's going on so he runs back to find Pinocchio and then the scene switches back to the eight ball bar where um, Lampwick is drinking beer and complaining about what the conscience said you know because he's kind of guilty and ashamed but he won't admit it because he doesn't admit anything he knows everything he's not going to admit anything about himself that isn't perfect he's a real totalitarian in training and he drinks this beer and he's laughing about the conscience and putting him down and then he says well what what is what does he say exactly what does he think I am a jackass or something like that maybe that's not the words exactly and then he grows these these ears and Pinocchio sees that and immediately takes a look at the beer and stops drinking it and then Lampwick transforms one more time and his face turns into the face of a donkey and he's laughing still and then his his hands oh yes he laughs and he starts to bray like a like a jackass and he's horrified by that and then Pinocchio laughs and the braying comes out as well and so now they're absolutely horrified and Lampwick actually figures out what's going on, he figures out that he's been tricked and that he's transforming and he's completely horrified by it, he becomes conscious of what's happening to him and there's one particularly, I would say, dramatic scene where his hands have transformed into hooves and he's kicking and, 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 and uh, leaping around the room in panic and he comes up to a mirror and sees himself as a jackass and then he turns around and breaks the mirror and so you know, he's self-conscious for a moment, then he destroys his capacity for self-consciousness, then he transforms entirely into a jackass. He's farther down the road than Pinocchio. And he comes crawling to Pinocchio to save him, and asks that the conscience comes back, so that he can get out of this, but of course it's a bit too late. And so then Pinocchio grows jackass ears, and he's absolutely terrified by it as well. He knows what's coming. And uh, the cricket comes back and... and guides them off Pleasure Island, and so then they end up on a cliff because this is an island after all, and they have to jump into the unknown right, out of this impulsive, adolescent, hedonic playground into the unknown and that's how they escape <laughs>